I think it's 1834, uh, Edgemore. All right. Can you tell me approximately what time of day you went there? Uh, somewhere between 7 and 7.30. This particular location, did you know these people? No, that's... Uh, No, that was part of my, uh, I guess my, what you call fantasy. These people were uh, selected. All right, so you, okay. Okay. you were engaged in some kind of fantasy during this period of time? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Now, when you use the term fantasy, is this something you were doing for your personal pleasure? Uh, sexual fantasy, sir. I see. So you went to this residence, and what occurred then? Well, uh, I had uh, did some thinking on what I was going to do to uh, either Mrs. Otero or Josephine and uh, basically broke into the house or didn't break into the house, but uh, when they came out of the house, I came in and confronted the family and then we went from there. All right. Had you planned this beforehand? To some degree, yes. Uh, after I got in the house, it, well, I lost control of it, but it, it was, you know, in the back of my mind, I had some ideas what I was going to do, but uh, I just, I basically panicked that first day, so. Beforehand, did you know who was there in the house? I thought Mrs. Otero and the two kids, the uh, two younger kids were in the house. I didn't realize Mr. Otero was going to be there. All right. How did you get into the house? I came through the back door, uh, cut the phone lines, uh, waited at the back door had reservations about even going or just walking away, but pretty soon the door opened and I was in. All right, so the door opened, was it open for you or did something? I think one of the kids, I think the uh, ju uh, junior, or not junior, yes, the uh, the young girl, uh, Joseph, opened the door. He probably left the dog out because the dog was in the house at that time. All right, when you went into the house, what happened then? Well, I confronted the family. Uh, pulled a pistol uh, in front of Mr. Otero and asked him to, uh, you know, that I was there to basically, I was uh, wanted, uh, wanted to uh, get the car, I was hungry, food, I was wanted, and I asked him to lie down in the uh, living room. And uh, at that time I realized that wouldn't be a really good idea, so I finally, the dog was a real problem, so I uh, asked Mr. Otero if he could get the dog out, so he had one of the kids put it out. I took him back to the bedroom. You took who back to the bedroom? Uh, the family, the bedroom, the four members. All right, what happened then? At that time, I tied him up. While still holding him at gunpoint? Well, in between tying and yes. Yeah. All right, after you tied them up, what did you do? Well, uh, they started complaining about uh, being tied up, and I re, re loosened the bonds a couple of times. Uh, tried to make Mr. Otero as comfortable as I could. Uh, apparently had a cracked rib from a car accident, so I had him put a pillow down on his, for his head. Uh, had he put a, uh, I think he used a parker or a coat underneath him. Uh, they, uh, you know, they talked to me about, uh, uh, you know, giving the car and whatever money. I guess they didn't have very much money. And uh, the, there I realized that, uh, you know, I was already. I didn't have a mask on or anything. They already could ID me and uh, made, a, made a decision to go ahead and, and put them down, I guess, or strangle them. All right. What did you do to Joseph Otero Sr.? Joseph Otero? Yeah, okay. Joseph Otero Sr., Mr. Otero, the father. I uh, put a plastic bag over his head and then some cords and tightened it. And this was in the bedroom? Yes, sir. Did he, in fact, uh, suffocate and die as a result of this? Not right away. No, sir, he didn't. What happened? Uh, well, after that, I, uh, I did miss this Otero. Uh, I had never strangled anyone before, so I really didn't know how much pressure you had to put on a person or how long it would take. But Was she also tied up there in the yes, bed? Yes, uh -huh. yeah, both her hands and their feet were tied up. She was on the bed. Where were the children? Uh, well, uh, Josephine was on the bed and uh, Junior was on the floor at this time. So, 
we're, we're talking first of all about Joseph Otero. So you put the bag over his head and tied it. Mm -hmm. And he did not die right away. Can you tell me what happened in regards to Joseph? Uh, he moved over real quick like and I think tore a hole in the bag and I could tell that he was having some problems there. But at that time the, the whole family just went, uh, they went panicked on me so I, I worked pretty quick. Uh, what did you, uh, you worked pretty quick. Well, what I mean, I, 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 I strangled Mrs. Otero, and she went out, or passed out. I thought she was dead. She passed out. Then I strangled uh, uh, Josephine. She passed out, or I thought she was dead. And uh, then I went over and uh, put a, uh, and then uh, put a bag on uh, uh, Junior's head, and uh, and then uh, if I remember right. Uh, Mrs. Otero came back. Uh, she came back and. Uh, Sir, let me ask you about Joseph Otero Sr. You senior? indicated he had torn a hole in the bag. Mm -hmm. and what did you do with him then? I put another bag over it, or either that or a. I recollect, I think I put a uh, either a cloth or a t shirt or something over it, over his head, and then a bag, another bag. And did, then he him. did he subsequently die? Well, yes. I mean, I, I mean, I was. I didn't just stay there and watch him. That I was moved around the room. But. All right. So you indicated you strangled Mrs. Otero after you had done this. Is that correct? Now I went back and strangled her again, that, and that that finally killed her at that time. So this is in regards to count two. You had, <laughs> first of all put the bag over Joseph Otero's head, mm -hmm. and he tore a hole in the bag. Mm -hmm. Then. You went ahead. Did you strangle Mrs. Otero then, okay. or did you go first back? Of all, first of all, Mr. Otero was strangled, or a bag put over his head and strangled. Then I thought he was going down, and I went over and strangled Mrs. Otero, and I thought she was down. Then I strangled uh, uh, Josephine, thought she was down, and then I went over to Junior and put the bag on his head. After that, Mrs. Otero woke back up, and uh, you know she was pretty upset. What's going on? So I came back, and uh, at that point in time, strangled her uh, for for the death strangle. At that time, with your hands or what? No, with a cord, with a with a rope. And uh, then I, uh, I think at that point in time, I redid Mr. Otero, put the bag over his head, uh, went over, and then took. Junior, oh, oh, before that, she asked me to uh, to, to uh, save her son, so I actually had taken the bag off, and then I was really upset at that point in time. So basically, when Mr. Terrell was down, Mrs. Otero was down, I went ahead and, and uh, took uh, uh, Junior, I put another bag over his head and took him to the other bedroom at that what, time. What did you do then? Uh, put a bag over his head, I put a, a cloth over his head, a t-shirt and a bag so he couldn't tear a hole in it. And, uh, he subsequently died from that. And then when I went back, uh, Josephine had woke back up. What did you do then? And I took her to the basement and eventually uh, hung her. Are you hung her in the basement? Yes, sir. Did you do anything else at that time? Yes, I, uh, I had some sexual fantasies. But that was uh, after she was hung. All right. What did you do then? And went through the house, uh, kind of cleaned it up. Uh, it's called the right hand rule. You go from room to room, uh, picked everything up. I think I took uh, Mr. Otero's watch. There, I guess I took a radio. I uh, I forgot about that, but apparently I took a radio. Why did I you got, take these things? I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Just uh, what happened then? I uh, got the keys to the car. In fact, I had the keys, I think, earlier before that because I want to make sure I had a, a way of getting out of the house and uh, clean the house up a little bit, make sure everything's packed up and left through the front door. And uh, they went there, went over to their car and then drove over to uh, Dylan's, left the car there, and then eventually walked back to my car. Okay, we're going to try introductions for the fifth time, Mom. All right. We are excited. This is the BTK uh, episodes. There'll be either two or three parts to this. We'll figure it out as we go. But my name is Sherry. I am the host of Outline of a Murder, the true crime podcast that goes into the why. And with me is Mom. 
Now, I've got to tell you something about mom. She lives in her own world. She has neighbors in there. She has her own food items and drink items. She probably has all the dogs that she wants and all the items that will make her happy. We call this genie world, Mm -hmm. and she Mm -hmm. likes it that way. (laughs) No problems, no drama, nothing. (laughs) Nothing affects me. Yes, yes. I love that. Sometimes you miss real life items that are going on. I don't care. No news, (laughs) no, no TV. So relaxing. Are you retired in your world, lounging by the pool, or still working? Yeah, I'm in Europe. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, this I, is one of my favorite cases. Not yeah. the murders, of course. Right. But right. Yeah, because it has so many things to it. It does. And he, I think, kind of broke the mold when it comes to the idea of serial killing. Uh, like before him... You know, there were lots of things, you know, because profiling was very new, Mm -hmm. and we're referring to Dennis Rader, and we always leave the scariest for the last of the the series, you know, extracting information to help people. There's really not much you can do when you have people like this guy around. To me, he was more interesting than the Zodiac Killer, the original one, they Mm -hmm. later named the Golden... um, You mean uh, Night Stalker? Yeah, Night Stalker. Because Zodiac's not been caught. Zodiac. Yes. Were you back in your world? Yeah, Where in been my caught? world, sorry. Okay. But, uh, yeah, that was fascinating to me how they found him. Mm-hmm. But this, to me, is real twists and turns and just all oh, so much. And we know that, you know, he changed who he killed where they thought before him that serial killers had a type. He changed how he killed. He also went uh, dormant for many, many years at a time, which they didn't think years. that. Yeah, they and thought that if you were a serial killer, you had to keep killing. Yeah, they said it was an urge. Mm-hmm. So, I know, I, that fascinates me about him. And uh, the Night Stalker original that was later named the Golden uh, State, State Killer. killer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he was dormant for a long time also. I think because he is old. It can be hard to kill people when you're old, I'm sure. Yeah, but even when he was younger and ended, he was dormant. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, like, they're, they're all poop They're birds. killers, but then they go dormant when they marry. So they don't kill the wife mm-hmm. or kids. It's just, it's fascinating. Well, um, you know, with Dennis Rader and what makes him, to me, scary is that he was the epitome of an all-American dad. Yes. The average Joe. I mean, he's someone that you would probably have a cold one with in the backyard, you know, barbecuing burgers and hot dogs. Man, yeah. it sounds like Stephen. I know, right? <laughs> but his daughter can attest to that later right. in the podcast. Yeah, because we'll go that, into some yeah. of her her stuff, which, by the way, um, a lot of people don't know that she wrote the book because a very famous author had written a book, I think, or a, a screenplay. That's right. Uh, on uh, and I don't know if it was on BTK or loosely, you know, I thought it was around on it. Him. Well, and it was so inaccurate that she decided she was going to come forward and write this book. I think she was silent for like ten years because she was tired of her family getting hit. And I think one of the misunderstandings is people they just can't understand how uh, you can be married to a serial killer and not know it. And lots of people on the shows we watch. Their questions all the time are, how did you not know? Right. But this is a case, too, of no signs right. within that time period. Yes, and we're always looking for signs. You know, that's that's what we do on this podcast. But really, I can't think of any. And I read her book from cover to cover, all the research I did. And, uh, and I mean, he was married to the same wife for yep. 34 years before going to prison. Uh, He also had, you know, his son and his daughter. And his son, I mean, he went into the military. His daughter is very well adjusted. He worked at regular jobs. He was even president of his Mm -hmm. Lutheran church. He was a Boy Boy Scout father. He was an Air Force vet. No, Boy Scout leader, too. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, he was a leader. And he... um she said you know there was just no sign yeah and even the way he was raised i mean even a lot of doctors just don't believe that he did not have anything happen to him or that he was raised in a normal home but you'll see from her book he was raised in a normal home yeah he was and he was so honest about everything i mean everything if you watch 
what would it be on show? YouTube? Well, yeah, on YouTube it has his entire confessions, but I've got those interspersed throughout the podcast. Yeah. And I've, I've got found, all of them, so I've you can listen to them. Yeah, in the, in the uh, outlineofamurderpodcast.com, mm-hmm. I found him credible. I mm-hmm. just don't think he would, you know, if he's that credible with really hor- horrific details... He's not going to lie about his childhood. Plus right. he has friends. He did say that he had a grudge against his mother, but there, it was like normal stuff. It right. wasn't, you know, like she was abusing him or anything like that. Which, by the way, we are finishing off our podcast with our favorite wines that we've mm-hmm. gone through this season. I've got the Stella Rosa Berry. I have Stella Rosa Black. Yep, both of them are fives. And mm-hmm. I've got a surprise one that's not Stella Rosa, believe it or not, at the uh, part two or part three of this this one. Yummy. So, he joined the Boy Scouts as a youth, which so did Bundy. I thought that was interesting. He was described as a quiet but polite young man who liked to keep to himself. And I'd say as far as personality-wise, you know, since I do that for a living, I'm going to put him probably at a CD personality, which they're both very task-focused, um, kind of low empathy they can tend to be psychopathic he's definitely a narcissist which we'll see because his narcissism is what actually caught him you know he just couldn't stand yeah that's just ridiculous you you get away with it all these years but he he had to have the attention yeah and then you trust someone that's after you which is hilarious, it was, it which we'll get bizarre. to. We'll get to, yeah. He showed no interest mm-hmm. in the music or activities of youth at his time. And one friend said that he was, quote, utterly lacking in any sense of humor and was studious and focused. He chose his words carefully when he spoke, probably because he was a C, but also probably to hide some of the fantasy world he's already mm-hmm. developed at this time. And he would give you his full attention and conversation. So I want to show you some of the early pictures of him. So this is him as a young man. And I had one of them when he was uh, in school. Which all these are on our website. This is one. uh, I think he's in his uh, uniform for work, which, by the way, when they caught him, he was working in the same building as the police department. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It is. And then this is him as well, you know, with a birthday cake. Does that say 71? I don't think so. That's a cow or something with oh, horns. Is or is it a puppy? Maybe it's a puppy. I and uh, I think I've got one more. Yeah, there he is again in his uniform. I mean, seriously, he looks like just a normal person. And um, yeah, it's just fascinating. Like in that one, he actually looks a little bit uh-huh. handsome in his younger yes. years. He graduated from Wichita Heights High School in 1963, and he worked at a grocery store during his high school years, I believe. Then he started college at Kansas Wesleyan College in Salina, or Salina. I'm not sure which way to, is it Salina? Because Dad would call it Salina, too, and he used to go there all the time when he truck drove. Uh, Kansas in the fall of 65. But he only did two semesters before he joined the Air Force, and he was 21 at that time. He was stationed first at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio for his basic training. Then he was stationed in Wichita Falls, Texas, Mobile, Alabama, Okinawa, and then mainland Japan near Tokyo until his service ended in 1970. I don't think there's any murders while he was stationed in those locations. They haven't said anything at right. all. So It makes you wonder, though. I know, because he was all over. And yeah. he had urges, as you'll get into, very early. He so. did. Maybe later they'll find something. I don't know. He also spent time in Korea, Greece, and Turkey while he was in the military. Wow. And it sounds like his tasks, too, were very technical. So he uh, installed antenna equipment and did other technical tasks. He also received Air Force Good Conduct Medal, the Small Arms Expert Markmanship Ribbon, and National Defense Service Medal. He returned home after being honorably discharged the summer of 1970, He then served two more years in the reserves, and then less than a year later, he met his wife, Paula Dietz, and they married May 22nd, 1971. So, I mean, again, it's like Dennis Rader's life starts out very, very normal. I don't remember hearing that he ever killed animals. Do you know Sherry? Uh, yes. Oh, he did? Uh-huh. Okay. Because that's yeah. definitely a we'll sign. Get, yeah, we'll get into that because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, he... 
even his own family, they were absolutely shocked to find out, you know, what type of person he was. But yes, I mean, he, and, and when you think back to how he was raised, it reminds me of like my dad or uh, my grandparents where, you know, the way they did things back then is the mother worked, I mean, the mm-hmm. father worked a lot, tend to be the disciplinarian, right? The, yes. the, um, the, the person that oversaw that all the kids grew up to be upstanding citizens. And then the mom would typically either sometimes work, but sometimes, you know, most of the time be a stay at home mom. Mm-hmm. And her, you know, that's what she did. She t- took care of the kids. She did the meals and all of that. And from what I can tell, it sounds pretty normal, but uh, Paula, her, his wife did work the whole time. Yeah, I remember that, but I don't remember. Did his parents live to see what a monster he was? His dad passed away before, and then his mother lived, and oh. um, she was pretty much devastated because, again, there was there's no evidence they were a jacked-up family at all. They were very, very normal, which is what makes this so scary. Paula was raised in the same area. She had the same mis- Midwestern values, they had both attended the same high school, but I don't think they knew each other before because he was 26, she was 23, so he would have been in a higher grade. She was also Lutheran like him, and once they married, they set up their home in Park City, which isn't far from Wichita, and then he worked at IGA in the meat department, and she was a bookkeeper. He did go like from job to job but for a while, but I don't think it's because he wanted to. Well, he got pretty good jobs, too. He it's did. Not like he got... He did. You know. It does seem that whenever he would be in between jobs, because he'd get laid off for the economy or whatever, that would be almost like a trigger, like a stress trigger. But I don't like how a lot of people make it sound like that's what caused him to kill, because he was already no. messed up in the head. But he was smart, by all accounts, that he was a pretty smart individual. Yeah. I don't like saying they're smart. Well, not but yes. smart as far as murder, but I mean intelligent wise well well i don't know he did well he might have had a learning disorder um he started working at coleman company remember the coleman grills and all that uh camping supplies he started there in the fall of 1973 and coleman was the largest employer at the time he only lasted 13 months there So while he worked there, he also attended Butler County Community College in El Dorado and earned an associate's degree in electronics in 1973, but he wasn't a very good student at all. His spelling was atrocious. As it still is. It is. You know what's interesting, though? That he went into what the field that he went into because he uses some of those skills to get in the house. Yeah. To cut the lines. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The computer. Mm-hmm. Mm. He, uh, it, well, and, and this is a rumor. I couldn't verify this, but whenever the BTK letters started up, him and his wife were watching the news. And uh, his wife said, huh, that's interesting. You and BTK, BTK spell the same. Oh, that is true, though. Is it? I don't know if it was his daughter or him, but he said, I believe... When she said that, it was him. Because he said in his mind, he was thinking, if she keeps up, I'm going to have to kill her. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I that was that. recent that I heard that. Okay. When I was watching that, a special. Yeah. So it was in one of the documentaries. It was true. Yeah. He was a CD student, so it took him about six years to earn his degree. But they think he might have had a learning disability. But back then, no one thought to look at those things. No. no. So we don't know for sure. And then he worked briefly for Cessna in 1973 or 1974, but he was fired. He later described that time as being unemployed, unhappy, with too much time on his hands, and he would kill his first victim in 1974. As far as anyone can tell, there was nothing in his childhood or past to explain how wickedly evil he would be. The only thing he mentioned was that he started developing fantasies about bondage, control, and torture in grade school. Mm -hmm. He was 14. Grade school. Oh, grade school. It was before. Then. Oh, it sure was. Yeah. I I remember. It was seven or eight, something very, very, very Like when he would get spanked, that would arouse him as a young boy, which is weird. Then when he hit puberty, he started fantasizing and dreaming of tying girls up and having his way with them. And his favorite victim in his fantasies was Mouseketeer Annette 
Finicello. Finicello. Mm-hmm. That was his favorite. He would fa- fantasize about tying her up and having his way with her. I wonder if he that really was his first killing. I, I do think so. You do. Because how sloppy he was, yeah, which we'll get true. into it. He, he was very sloppy. <clears throat> he also cut fo- uh, out photos of women from magazines called Slick Ads that aroused him. And then he would uh, draw ropes and put gags on them. And he glued them on, get this, three by five index cards that he carried around with himself as a teenager. He did admit later to hanging dogs and cats which is a very oh, typical pre-serial yep, killer sociopathic behavior. And hanging. Mm-hmm. And he also said that he um, got aroused when he saw the chickens get slaughtered on the farm for them to eat. Wow. Uh, and the strangling in particular he you know, liked. Sometimes you hear about this stuff and you're like, how could he walk around normal mm-hmm. and not this madness come out? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, a lot of the serial killers, they're able to car- compartmentalize them. I think he did that better than probably any of them except for Gary Ridgway. Be- there's no, he doesn't have any criminal record. Like if you look at the Green River killer, Gary Ridgway had um, been picked up for pros- you know, soliciting prostitution a couple times. There's nothing on Raider. There's no speeding ticket, arrest record, nothing on him. So well, he had to, to put it in a different department because... He he was dormant for mm-hmm. twenty five years. Right. He got. He said he got busy. Yeah, but he's a killer, serial killer. He got Which busy. Psychologists for years said oh, that's an urge. They can't help urge. Serial killers have to do it. And then we're finding more and more are not. That's doing not it. the case. Dormant. Yeah. When he lost his job, he developed his fantasy life even more, and he began to wonder what it would feel like to strangle somebody to death. Now, I want to briefly before we get into the first murder discuss sexual status and like we said in one podcast that's been some light reading before bed right that i've been doing by a fbi profiler and he stated his name is roy hazelwood and i'm reading his book called dark dreams a legendary fbi profiler examines homicide in the criminal mind and he said that sexual sadists are considered the great white sharks of sexual sadists that keep their fantasies to themselves. And so most, that's what they do. Uh, some will cross the line into killers as well. But it said that sexual sadists derive pleasure and arousal by seeing someone tortured and terrified. That's what arouses them, not the sexual act itself. And then some sexual sadists will keep their perverse fantasies and fantasy world performing, you know, sex acts along or with consensual or paid partners. And I didn't know anyone would consent to that, but I guess so. But a criminal sexual sadist is one who will now begin to act out his fantasies on their victims, causing tremendous injury or death. Sexual sadists like the game. They like playing God. They like complete control. And they spend a lot of time fantasizing with extreme detail. So Remember? They, all the time they fantasize. That show we watched last night was about that. Mm-hmm. He was for sure. First yes, it he was. was just sex, rough sex, and then it kept... And she was too. Yeah, and then it kept on, and then it went to murder. That's a, a killer speaks. I don't remember yeah. her name, but she um, is a poop bird. Because she wouldn't own up to what she did. Yeah. She acting all nice else. and acting yeah. all like yeah. she's this sweet little she, innocent thing. You don't think of a woman doing that. Right. Right. Their urges and their compulsions start young and they progress over time. Most sexual sadists are white men. And at first, Hazelwood thought it must be a white man thing. Right? And he's like, right. okay, it has to be uh, you know, pretty much dominant to ca- Caucasian men. But he then started seeing more and more black sexual sadists. And he realized when he started looking at the different characteristics and income levels and professional types of all the sexual sadists, he found out it's a middle class problem. Oh. Yes. So it can be it can be anybody. Any race. Anybody. Any race. But he found that most of them are middle class. Most of them are also intelligent, sophisticated, and excessively planned. Some are even in a class of their own as obsessive drivers who drive thousands of miles in a month sometimes. Ted Bundy is one of those examples Mm because he would drive a lot. They love trolling for victims either by driving or walking around certain areas of town, neighborhoods, or campuses. 
And sometimes they just see someone in the course of a normal day and begin an elaborate stalking and planning stage before attacking. So Dennis Rader was a sexual sadist. Yeah, and that describes him, all of him. All of those describe him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if he did tons and tons of driving, because we'll see from reading about the murders that I don't think that was the case. No, but he drove. If he's driving somewhere, he had his uh, and he'd wife see and one. his daughter. If he saw someone, that'd be it. That's who he'd go after. Yeah. And he well, uh, the, uh, I don't know how to exactly say that. I had many, what I call them projects. There were different people in the town that I followed, watched. Uh, Captain Bright was one of the next targets, I guess, as I would indicate. How did you select her? Uh, just driving by one day, and I saw her go in the house with somebody else, and I thought that's a possibility. There was many, many places in the area, uh, College Hill, they're all over Wichita. But anyway, that's, it just was basically a selection process, work toward it. If it didn't work, I'd just move on to something else. But in the, in the, my kind of person, a stalking and scrolling. You go through the uh, trolling stage and then a stalking stage. She was in the stalking stage when this happened. Um, All right, sir. So you identified Catherine Bright as a potential victim. Yes, sir. What did you do here in Sudbury County then? Pardon? What did you do then here in Sudbury County? Well, on this particular day, yes. uh, I broke into the house and waited for her to come home. How did you break into the house? Uh, through the back door on the east side. All right, and you waited for her to come home. Where yes, did sir. you wait? Uh, in the house there, probably close to the bedroom. I walked to the house and uh, kind of figured out where I'd be if they came through. Um, All right. What happened then? Uh, she and uh, Kevin uh, Bright came in. Uh, I wasn't expecting him to be there. Uh, and come find out, I guess, they were related. Uh, at that time, I... Uh, approached him and told him I was wanted in California, uh, needed some car, ba basically the same thing that I told the Turtles, uh, kind of ease him, make him feel better, and proceeded to, I think I had him tie, I think I had him tie her up first, and then I tied him up or vice versa, I don't remember right now. now that let, let me ask, you mm -hmm. indicated you had some uh, items to tie these people with. Did you bring these items, both the Oteros and to this location? The Oteros I did, uh, I'm not really sure on the Brights. Uh, there was some, I, when I and working with the police, there was some controversy on that. Probably more likely I did, but uh, if, if I had brought my stuff and used my stuff, uh, Kevin would probably be dead. But, I'm not bragging on that. It's just a matter of fact. It's the bonds I've uh, tied him up with, it, he broke them. So. And, uh, All right. And maybe same way with uh, same way with Catherine. It was I got out of got out of hand. All right. Now you indicated that you believe you had Kevin tie Catherine up. Mm -hmm. Tell me what happened then. Okay. I moved. Uh, well, after I really can't remember, Judge, whether I had her tie him up or she tied him up. But anyway, I moved. Uh, Basically, I moved her to another bedroom, and he was already secure there by the bed. Uh, tied his feet to the uh, bedpost, the bottom the bedpost, so he couldn't run. Uh, kind of tied her in the other bedroom, and then I came back to strangle him. And at that time, we had a fight. Were you armed with a handgun at that time also? Yes, I had a handgun. What happened when you I came back? I actually had two handguns. Uh, well, when I started strangling, the, either the uh, parent broke or he broke his bonds and he jumped up real quick like. I pulled my gun and quickly shot him, hit him in the head, he fell over, uh, I could see the blood and as far as I concerned, he, you know, I thought he was down and uh, was out and then went and uh, started to strangle uh, after Catherine and uh, then we started fighting because uh, bonds weren't very good and so Back and forth, we fought. Uh, you and Catherine? Yeah, we fought. Uh, and I got the best of her, and I thought she was going down, and then I could hear some movement in the other room. So I went back, and Kevin, uh, no, no. I thought she was going down, and I went back to the other bedroom where Kevin was at, and I tried to restrangle him at that time. And he jumped up, and we fought, and, uh, and he about, at that time, about shot me because he got the other pistol that was in my shoulder here. I had my magnum in my shoulder. 
So, and a shoulder really holster. Hmm? Did you have it in a shoulder holster? Yes, and on the heavy magnum and a shoulder holster. The other one was a 22. And we fought at that point in time, and I thought it was going to go off. I jammed the gun, stuck my finger in, the, in there, jammed it. And uh, I think he thought that was the only gun I had because once I either bit his finger or hit him or something got away, and I used the 22 and shot him one more time. And I thought he was down for good at that time. All right, so you shot him a second time. Yes, sir. What happened then? Uh, went back to uh, uh, finish the job on Catherine, and uh, she was fighting. Uh, and at, at that point in time, I've been fighting her. I just, and then I heard some, I don't know whether I, uh, basically losing control, the uh, strangulation wasn't working on her, and I uh, used a knife on her. You say you used a knife on yes. her. Yes. What did you do with the knife? I stabbed her. I think she said either stabbed two or three times, uh, either here or here. Maybe two back here and one here, or maybe just two times back and here. You were pointing to your lower back and your... your yeah, underneath the ribs. And your lower abdomen. Yeah, underneath the ribs, up, up under the ribs. So after you stabbed her, what happened? Uh, actually, I think at that point in time, well, it was a total mess because I didn't have control on it. Uh, she was bleeding. Uh, she went down. Uh, I think I just went back to check on Kevin or at that basically same time I heard him escape. It could be one of the two. But all of a sudden the front door of the house was open and he was gone. And uh, or, Oh, i tell you what I thought. I thought the police were coming at that time. I heard the door open. I thought, no, that's it. And I stepped out there, and he, I could see him running down the street, so I quickly cleaned up everything that I could and left. All right, now, Mr. Rader, you indicated that at the Oteros you did not have a mask on. Did you have a mask on at the Brights? No, no, I didn't. All right, so what happened then? Uh, I tried, to, I had already had the keys to the cars, uh, and I thought I had the right key to the right car. I ran out to their car, and, what, and I think it was a pickup out there. Tried it, didn't work, and uh, at that point in time, I was—he was gone, running down the street. I thought, yeah, I'm in trouble. So I tried it, didn't work. So I just took off, ran, and went down, went east, and then worked back toward the WSU campus where my car was parked. All right. So you had parked your car at the Wichita State University yes, sir, campus. On the campus uh -huh. How far away were uh, was the bride's residence? Oh, I parked. Uh, was that 13th? And they're, uh, let's see, they're, they were on 13th, was it 17th? Yeah. Uh, I, was pretty, I was just about one block south of 17th where the car was. Uh, oh. there, there's a park there. I parked by that park. And then I walked to 13th or to the Bright's residence. So I basically ran back. All right. He planned it. So, yeah, except for driving all over the place. Mm -hmm. But he did drive and, and you know, see him. pick his victims. Yeah. Some of his victims. So we're going to dive into the first murder. And uh, it's really sad. So just real quick, uh, just so you guys know, there is children involved. And uh, so it's going to be disturbing. And hopefully murder podcasts aren't for children. They're not. So hopefully... You, you know, you're not listening like to it with your kids around. <laughs> right. Yeah. But man, you're kind of finishing that uh, wine. wine off really a little good. quick. Well, so you know. I mean, I had less than you. I had three ounces. That's what I have. You had more. It was good. It is good. <laughs> Dennis Rader decided to target a woman for his first murder that he had seen one day when he dropped off his wife for work. She didn't like driving in the snow, and he had a thing he said for Hispanic women. He admired their beauty and dark hair. Was his wife Hispanic? Mm -mm. She wasn't Hispanic, was she? Mm -mm. He gathered, he, I guess he called it hit kit. I don't know if this was a legal term that detectives use, but I had never heard of it as well, a hit kit. I've heard at, of burglary kit. Look at Israel Keys. He had murder kits. I, well, I, I know. To me, it'd be like a murder kit. So I don't oh, know if he called hit. it a hit kit, but that, that was used in everything I looked up was oh. hit kit. So I'm thinking that must have come from him. And it always included a gun, a cord, knives, and various tools for breaking and entering. He observed the house for a time so he could figure out what their daily schedule was. On January 15, 1974, Dennis Rader approached the Otero family home at 8 a.m. in the morning while his wife was still asleep at home. 
So he had seen them when he had dropped her off one day, but on this day, uh, she's still at home. He snuck into the yard, cut the phone line, and barged in through the back door, which I bet that was a time still in the 70s where no one locked their doors to. Nobody did. And after he was in, which you'll probably get to, he was surprised. Mm Mm-hmm. Because not all of them were supposed to be home. Yes. So when he goes in there, the Otero family, they're going through their busy morning routine. They were a family of seven, you know, so it could be very chaotic, I'm sure. The three oldest children had already left for school. Joseph Otero is the dad. He was 38. Julie Otero was 33. And then Josephine was 11. And Joseph Jr. was 9. So they were still at the house finishing up last-minute things when Dennis Rader broke in. And they weren't as he expected. Didn't they have five kids? Seven. Seven kids? Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was a family of seven. So, so yeah, it was five. Two of them were gone. Uh, it'd be three. A little boy. It'd be three. Three, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think this is, yeah, this is the Otero family. And uh, this is little Josephine right yeah. here. And this is little Joey. Uh, I think I have another picture of them. This is the crime scene where they were taking out the bodies. Uh, after they discovered them. And the way they were discovered was really, really sad. It's horrific. Uh, Let's see here, just to show you some of the other. Yeah, so these first victims, and she is pretty, Julie Otero. Very. very. I got so many pictures, because there's actually a lot of rich information about um, him. Lots of photos and things. So the first thing that was unplanned is a vicious dog. So they had a vicious dog. Second, two of the children were there. Third, the husband was still there. See, he thought just the wife would be there. So Raider used the gun to gain control quick, and he ordered Joseph to put the dog in the backyard. He told them that he was a wanted criminal, that he needed money, food, and a car to escape, right? Now, this is a typical tactic of killers. And this was his first Yes, his very first murder. And this is something to understand. Killers will always lessen what they're going to do to get the victims to comply. You know, they're not going to say, hey, I'm going to kill you in a few minutes unless they know they have absolute control. Right. Usually they're like, hey, I just want some money or, hey, I just, you know, I need some food and your car keys. or If you cooperate, I'll let you go. Yes, I'll let you go. And, And so people will comply and they'll tie them up and then you're stuck. They said maybe... She tied the husband up. I'm gonna get into that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just so you know, that's usually that's usually a lie. They're they're going to kill, and um, and so don't fall for it. And you know, I mean, again, if they say I'm gonna kill you, there'd be pandemonium. I mean, oh yeah. You know, the senior he's gonna try everything he can at that point to protect his family. So at first, and and this is where it's like surreal, I'm sure, for the family when this happened, is Joseph Sr. thought it was some kind of joke from his brother-in-law. Oh, that's terrible. But it wasn't long, obviously, before he realized it wasn't a joke. So at this point, Raider took all of them into a bedroom and tied them up. So I guess I don't have it in here. So from what you understand, he had the wife tie up Sr.? Yeah, but I thought... That he had put them, the the kids, because they were making too much noise in the bathroom, and had no, locked that, the door. I think you're, I think you're getting the murderers confused. Okay, I could be, it could be a different case. Yeah, because there's other ones. Okay. Yeah, okay. he uh, put a bag over Joe Senior's head to suffocate him. Joe fought really hard, tearing holes in the bag. Raider used a cord ligature to subdue him and finally kill him. Did he do the bag and then release, bag release? No, he he just put the bag on him. But you know by him putting a bag on him that he's trying to make it as torturous as possible. And so he, he did. He put holes in the bag. He kept tearing holes in it. And so finally he just used a ligature. He next focused on Julie by manually strangling her, strangling her, but it took longer and it was more difficult to strangle than Raider thought from watching movies. 
Yeah, they say it takes what three minutes, three to five, and that that would be a eternity and a lot of exertion. Yeah, and that, he thought he had her killed, but she actually had just passed out, and she came to later. So then he strangled her again, killing her, and she begged him before she died not to kill her children. Uh, so here's the thing. And again, this is going to get disturbing. So if you don't like to hear about children getting killed, then you might want to fast forward. But uh, he did not know yet how to kill efficiently. No. You see mistakes already. It reminds me of Chris Watts in our Family Annihilator series where he killed the little girls twice. That's the kind of poop bird he is. He was a piece of work. He he thought he had smothered them, and then they came to as he's getting his dead wife's body loaded up, and they're scared. And uh, so it's the same thing here. He thought he had, you know, the senior taken Mm -hmm. care of. He tears holes. He thinks he has a wife taken care of. He has to strangle her twice. Once he got the parents dead, he then turned his attention on Joey. Now, keep in mind, he went in for Julie Otero. Yes. The only reason he's killing everybody is because it's opportunity, plus he probably didn't want to be caught. I bet he really thought, too, a bonus. Mm-hmm. Oh, I bet absolutely. he enjoyed it, having more in there. Oh, I'm sure he did. Controlled. And that's what's also important to understand about killers, these type of killers. They like it. That That is beyond our grasp. You know, as normal people, uh if fear of the you know being in jail doesn't deter you, at least hopefully your conscience and who you are as a person would. Uh, but for these people, they love it. They do, and that's why. Like it's amazing how you know they'll kill, they'll get caught, and you get these groupies that hang around, and they think they can change them, and they think they, blah, blah blah. To me, I think if they ever got out. They'd probably go straight for the one that oh, yeah. supposedly they married they in would. prison. They would. Well, I mean, you even have Ted Bundy where he admitted later to Elizabeth Kendall that he tried to kill her at least once, but if I'm not mistaken, twice. He was. And remember, he uh, was pushing her under the water on that rafting trip. Yeah, he was. So they don't love. They don't know how to love. It's very interesting. If they exhibit any type of love, it's usually more of a possession type thing, or this is what I have to do to maintain cover. But it's interesting they don't typically kill who they're with. Usually. And the only thing I can think of is maybe they have some type of loyalty or affection, because true love will be where you lay down your life for someone else, right? So they're not going to do that. They're narcissists and psychopaths. Or maybe they think it'd be too close to home, they'd be caught immediately. That's what I think. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, Yeah, I don't think it's any love or loyalty type deal. Right. So he takes little Joey into his own bedroom. He put a bag over his head. He got a chair. He sat down and he watched him die. At Isn't some that horrible, point, horrible, horrific. Yeah, yeah. At some point, uh, Joey rolled off the bed and he died face down on the bedroom floor. So now that leaves Josephine. He attempted to strangle her, but she too woke up. So he forced her down into the basement. He put a noose around her neck and then threw it over the sewer pipe. And then he told her that she'd soon be in heaven with the others. He pulled her bottom clothes off and masturbated while she died. Now, I do know on that special I was watching, they did say um, when she would get close to death, he would release her, that he had done it a couple times. See, I I haven't seen that in anything I researched. Yeah, Susan and I saw it the other night. Are you sure it's Josephine and not one of the other victims? Pretty sure, yeah. Hmm, okay. Well, I mean, you can do some research. I might be wrong. But I think that that's what we want. Well, and like I said, I will be playing his full confessions periodically through these episodes because he talks about it. But, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me because that's what a sexual sadist does. They want to prolong the terror, prolong the torture. So I could absolutely see him doing something like that. It's terrible. He tidied up a bit. He collected his things and then he left. He always took souvenirs. So he took Joe's watch and a small radio, which, by the way, the daughter remembers listening to music. Wow. 
He drove their Oldsmobile station wagon to a nearby supermarket, su- supermarket? supermarket, almost wrecking it into an un- oncoming vehicle as he pulled out of their driveway. A lady saw him get out of the car at the parking lot, quote, shaking like a leaf. He tossed the car keys onto the roof of a place called Dylan's, and they walked back to his own car. Then he realized he was missing his knife. Oh, no. So he drove back to the Otero house, parked his car in the garage, and then he found his knife in the yard. Charles, Charlie Otero, 15, Daniel Otero, 14, and Carmen Otero, 13, arrived home from school, and they found their, their parents dead. One of the Otero kids said that they thought that Joey and Josephine were at school, and he said, if I had seen their dead bodies, it might have made me go insane. Now, didn't he walk in, but the other two were outside? I'm not sure how it went. I'm about to play a video of him okay. talking about because I think it's Daniel Otero that does a lot of the interviews. It is, and I, I thought he had said he walked in and he had the other two stay outside. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that went. But I'm not 100%. I it just, could be because, I mean, obviously, you know, they found the parents and probably took off running out to get help did, yeah uh but they didn't go any further into joey's room or the basement and i'm so glad they didn't because i think it would be hard enough seeing your parents but to see your little sister violated that way and your little baby brother like that i, I don't see how anyone would keep their sanity and he said that he said i probably would have lost my mind yeah and it's sad because he relives it on every special every news i mean because it's it still goes and they still interview him and well, and or he has to agree, you know, right. I, I, it is amazing to me, like, you know, you have some that they never want to be interviewed. You have others that they are, and it makes me wonder, like, is it a therapy thing for them? Is it they make, want others aware? Yeah, to make people aware. I think it would be hard to talk about that. I think that. it's a little both. Yeah. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, he probably he probably couldn't do it right away. Oh, I'm sure. But I think. Well, he wasn't caught for a long, long time. Right, so, yeah. So, uh, I'm going to play this video of him talking about it. Okay. Relatively new family to Wichita. They're a family of seven, five kids. And the older kids had gone off to school that day, leaving the two younger ones at home with their parents. My name is Charlie Otero, and I am the son of Joseph and Julie Otero. I ran down the hall went in their bedroom and saw my mother on the bed, my father on the floor. My heart just got ripped out of my chest. My life changed instantly. I thank God every day that I didn't find Joey and Josie because I don't know how I could have handled it. PTSD kicked in. My first semester of college, started drinking, using drugs, trying to get the memory out of my head, trying to get the visions out of my head, just trying to deal with the grief and the anger that I had going on inside me. And that's basically where I stayed for 30 years. The day Dennis Rader was caught, I was um, working to do landscaping. I got the phone call from my sister. She said they got him. I said, yeah, right. She goes, no, they really got him. They swear it's him. I said, okay, and I put the phone down, and I remember bushes flying 10 feet high over my head. I was ripping them out of the ground. When we were going into the courthouse for sentencing, I had come up with a plan to get my hands on Dennis Rader. No matter what happened to me, I didn't care. I just wanted revenge. When we returned from lunch, I was confronted by a a friend of mine at the time who had a phone call from my ex-girlfriend, the mother of my son saying, Charlie, Joseph's been hit by a car and said he's in a coma. He'd been hit by a car. After that phone call, all need for revenge went away and all I could think about was my son. And so when the opportunity finally came, and it did come, for me to get my hands on Dennis Rader, I had no desire. All I could think about was God saving my son. My son woke up months later, a newborn child. God answered my prayers and saved my son. And that changed my life. I told God at that time, I said, I'll give my life. I, I'll give you everything to save my son. And to this day, I, I try to live up to that. 
I'm driven whenever I get a chance to speak on a, a message of hope and, and redemption. And I do a lot of speaking in prisons, in uh, halfway houses and stuff, trying to get people to understand that they can change their ways. We are a product of our environment. And for one moment, Dennis Rader was in my environment, even though I never really um, was involved with him, his actions dictated my world. And I, I was wrong in letting what he did dictate who I was for so long. I've turned that around and my family is with me all the time. I take the memories of my family and use that to guide me and also my promise to God. So that's neat that he talks about why he talks. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I was wondering that. He's in a lot of it's those amazing. episodes. Yeah. But, you know, that desire to take vengeance, I remember um, when I was a kid, let's see, was I 13? And remember that um, I think he was a karate instructor that kidnapped that little boy and abused him. And I think his family was from like Alabama or something and I remember we were watching the nightly news when we lived in Odessa and they were extraditing that man because they found him with a little boy and they were extraditing him back to the state where he kidnapped the little boy and the dad was out on the tarmac and when they brought him down he shot him dead right there and the uh, jury let him go because they said it was like temporary insanity for what happened to his son. Well, I probably would have done the same. Yeah, so I can imagine the rage that he Inside had. For all those years. Yeah, yeah. So that was neat hearing that and, and why he talks to this day. And so it was Charlie, not Daniel. So that was really, really good. Once Raider had his first kill, he wanted more. After killing over half of the Otero family in January 1974, Raiders spied a woman named Catherine Bright entering her home and decided she would be next. It was that random. He's literally driving by, sees her go into her house. He began stalking her to learn her routine and who might be a hindrance to his plan. On April 4th, 1974, he broke into her home using the back porch door and hid in a bedroom waiting for her. Catherine and her 19-year-old brother, Kevin, arrived at her home around 2 p.m. Kevin didn't live there, but he'd gone with her that day to run an errand. Raider came from the bedroom with his gun in hand. He told the same story of being a criminal in need of food, money, and a car. He forced both of them into a bedroom, and he forced Kevin to tie up his sister. He then took Kevin to a different room to tie him up up but unfortunately for Raider he number one didn't expect Kevin to be there so again he's again, you know being surprised surprise number two he didn't bring his quote best hit kit so he had to improvise with materials from Catherine's home Kevin got loose and engaged Raider in a life or death fight he almost got Raider's gun Raider grabbed it back shot Kevin in the face but Kevin didn't stop he kept fighting Raider until Raider shot him a second time in the head, and he seemed like he was dead or dying, so Raider turned his attention back to Catherine. Now, here's something that when I was writing this and researching it, I, I thought of. So Catherine's tied up in her room, and she's hearing this life or death struggle. She's hearing gunshots. You know, I mean, she's probably wondering, okay, is her brother dead? Is the intruder dead? Hopefully her brother can save her. Be a mixture of both. Yeah. Because you're thinking, oh, he killed. Hope or fear. Yeah. You know. Yeah, all in one. And you can imagine her terror and disappointment when and Raider then, walked in. And then relief. Terror, relief, terror, relief. Mm -hmm. It'll be horrible. Yeah, horrible. but once he was in there, she knew that he was probably, or probably thought he was dead, that she would be next. She also fought, and so Raider decided that he'd have to stab her versus strangling her, so he stabbed her deeply in the abdomen and other areas, but Kevin wasn't dead. He was only stunned, so he gathered himself and ran out of the house screaming for help, which was very, very smart. Because most people might go to try to fight the assailant again just to save the sister, 
that's a guaranteed death warrant. He already was probably, Mm -hmm. you know, spended. He was at the, you know, the last of his strength. And so the only thing to do was to get out of the house and get help. And I thought that was very smart of him under pressure. Very smart. Because he'd already been shot. Yeah, and dazed. Yeah, and dazed. You know, by the gun shot to the head. It's just... Uh, it's just a miracle. Yeah. Really. Yeah. The whole situation. But you can tell uh, Dennis Rader's mistakes. You know yes. what I mean? Yes. Yes. And he's new at it. You know, this is like his second uh, murder. And I think that I might have a picture of the young man um, and Catherine, Catherine and Kevin. So this is Kevin later. Uh, he still, to this day, has some of the wounds, they say, on his head. Um, but her picture is up here. Where's she at? Right there. Yeah. yeah so she was really pretty. She's very pretty. Uh, Raider, he made a hasty exit. He ran from the scene on foot to his car that was blocks away. He cleaned up, and he put his good husband mask back on before his wife came home from work. And I'm sure they had a lovely evening discussing mundane things over dinner. Uh, Catherine, in the meantime, died in the hospital a few hours later despite surgery and blood transfusions to try to save her. Kevin was in critical condition, but he survived. Boy, he was lucky. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, if you want to call it that, you're living with the fact your sister was murdered. Yeah. I thought I had a picture of Kevin... Uh, with the wounds that he sustained and then the um, the post after he healed up, but I can't find them. I'll kind of go through and we'll see them in part uh, two because we're nearing the end of part one. So I'll try to find them. Now, the police have no idea at this point that these two murders are connected and they do get a sketch of him uh, I don't have that. I have looked at it, and I don't think it looks anything like them. But there is, let's see, sketches of Dennis Rader that he drew and some of the torture and the things that he wanted to do. But you can see the bind, the torture, and see the rope mm-hmm. around her neck and all that. I but, saw some of his drawings. His drawings aren't bad, but he's very detailed in them. Yes, yes. Well, and he had a very detailed fantasy life, so it makes sense that in the drawings, you know, he was going to be uh, pretty detailed. Yeah, and you can see he took care in those drawings, you know, for details and just, it just. Actually, on that one, she was completely random. Uh, there was actually someone across from Dylan's was a potential target. Uh, it was called Project Green, I think. I had project numbers assigned to it. And that particular day, I uh, drove to Dillon's parked in the parking lot, watched this particular residence, and then got out of the car and walked over to it. Uh, it's probably the police report, the address. I don't remember the address now. Knocked. Nobody, nobody answered it. So I was all keyed up. So I just uh, started going through the neighborhood. I'd been through the neighborhood before. I kind of knew. A little bit of the layout of the neighborhood. Uh, I've been through the back alleys, knew where some certain people live. Uh, while I uh, was walking down Hydraulic, uh, I met a, a young boy <coughs> and asked him if he ID some pictures. Uh, kind of was a rust, I guess, or loose, as you call it, and kind of feel it out. And I saw where he went, and I went to another address and knocked on the door. Nobody opened the door, so I just noticed where he went and went to that house and we went from there. Now you, you call these projects, uh, were these sexual fantasies also? Potential hits, yeah, in my world, that's what I call them. All right. So they you went, projects, hits. All right, and, and why did you have these potential hits? Was this to gratify some sexual interest? Or? Yes, sir. I had, there, I had a lot of them, so it's just, if one didn't work out, I just moved to another one. So, as I'm to understand it, then, on the 17th of March, 1977, you saw this little boy go into a residence, Mm -hmm. and you tried another residence, no one was there. You tried another residence, no one was there, so you went to the residence with the little boy. And I watched watched where he went. What happened then? Uh, After I tried this once a residence, nobody came to the door. I went to this house where he went in, knocked on the door, 
and told him I was a private detective, uh, showed him a picture that I had just showed the boy, and asked him if they could ID the picture. And at that time, I, I had the gun here, and I just kind of forced myself in. I just uh, walked in, just opened the door, walked in, and then pulled what, the pistol. What gun? What pistol? Uh, 357 Magnum. So you only had one gun with your pistol? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh -huh. What happened to it? Uh, I told uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Payan that uh, I had a problem with uh, sexual fantasies, that I was going to tie her up, and that uh, I might have to tie the kids up, and that she would cooperate with us, cooperate with me at that time. Uh, we went back, uh, she was extremely nervous, I think she even smoked a cigarette, and we went back to uh, one of the back, back areas of the porch, explained to her that I had done this before, and uh, yeah, I think she was, at that point in time, I think she was sick because she had a night robe on. And I think I remember right, she was she had been sick. And I, I think she came out of the bedroom when I went in the house. So anyway, we went back to the, her bedroom and I proceeded to tie the kids up. And they started crying and got real upset. So I said, oh, this is not going to work. So we moved them to the bathroom. She helped me. And then I tied the door shut. We put some toys and... Uh, Blankets and odds and ends in there for the kids, make them as comfortable as we could. Tied the, uh, we uh, tied one of the bathroom doors shut so they couldn't open it, and we shoved. She went back and helped me shove the bed up against the other bathroom door, and then I proceeded to uh, tie her up. Uh, she got sick, threw up, um, got her a glass of water, comforted her a little bit, and then went ahead and tied her up, and then uh, put a bag, a bag over her head and strangled her. All right, was this a plastic bag also? Yes, sir. I think it was, but I could be wrong on that. You put a bag. It, it was something. I'm sure it was plastic bag. Yeah. Now you say you put a bag over her head and strangled her. What did you strangle her with? Uh, I actually, I think on that, I had tied uh, tied her legs to the uh, bedpost and worked up with the rope all the way up, and then what I had left over, I looped over her neck. All right. So you used this uh, rope to strangle. Her. Yes, I think I think it's the same one that I tied her body with. Right. What happened then? Well, the, uh, the kids were really banging on the door, hollering, screaming, and uh, and then the telephone rang, and they had talked about earlier that the neighbor was going to check on them, so I cleaned everything up real quick like and got out of there. Yeah, it's awful, and but we can see again that he's new to the murder. Oh, yeah. You know, that this actions. is a new thing, and he's still figuring it out. Now, at the time of these killings, you know, we've talked about this in some of the episodes this season. It was a golden age of serial killers. So between uh, 1974 to about 1978, close to the 80s even, there were five serial killers operating in America. Ted Bundy, John Gacy, Dennis Rader, Gary Ridgway, and Jeffrey Dahmer. The term serial killer wasn't even a thing yet. No, it wasn't. Yeah. So they had no idea. Again, they're not connecting these kills. Plus, you know, in the Terra home, you've got strangulation, you have hanging, et cetera, et cetera. In the Bright case, you have stab wounds and gunshots. You know? Wow. And, and I'm wondering, like, did, not, did anyone not hear the gunshots? I mean, the gun went off twice. How did he have time to torture and murder Catherine. Well, were they in the city? And besides that, I live in the country, and I I hear their gunshots later. I'm told, but it, it doesn't sound like a gunshot to me because they're sort of at a distance. They can sound very similar. Uh, before I started shooting, I would often mistake firecrackers for yeah. gunshots. Yeah. So now that I shoot. I know very clearly the sound of gunshots, gun. and yeah. I can pick them up. And usually if I hear them, I'll call, because you just never know. I'm going to call the know. police. And, uh, and you know, we've got neighbors. They like to shoot off their guns sometimes. And so, yeah, I'll go ahead and call the police. <laughs> okay, so Raider quit killing for a while. Yep. Unusual. Very. I well, just can't get over that. Why do you that. think he did? Do you think know. he needed to hone his craft that he maybe was he was even... afraid he'd get caught? Well, I know, again, in the special Susan and I were watching, I think it was him that said, no, it was the daughter. Um, she thought it was because he was having a child, had kid, when he started having kids. I don't know if that's true. Listen, I'm not 100%, but I read, I mean, when we watched that, it said, she thought it was something to do with, you know, 
having the children. children. What do you think? Did she say that in the book? <sighs> no. I know he has said that. Okay, that's my. I might be mistaken. But I actually wonder if he was scared he'd get caught. Because once he had the hiatus, um, he actually came back very, very good at what he does. He did. And he studied. Yeah, and so it makes me wonder. But look, I found some of the other pictures I was looking for. So this is him as an adolescent. Again, looks like a normal kid. That's him mm-hmm. as a teenager. He's handsome. He He's is. a handsome young man. That's normal. Right here, same thing. Very, very handsome. And uh, But I don't have the picture of Kevin Bright with his head wounds and then without him. It wasn't grotesque or anything, or I wouldn't show you. Um, and then this right here, this is a sketch. I found it. That's the sketch of the man. It, it looks, looks nothing, nothing like, like Dennis Rader. Nothing. Yeah. So, again, there's no way anyone's no. going to recognize that as him. But people that that describe um, suspects in any case, they say you could get two or three people and they'd all be different. Mm-hmm. All yes. Them, so. Yeah. Um, confessions, uh, drawings, composite sketches are usually very off. There's been a couple, though, that it was very eerie. And because they were so close, but they're not real reliable. Right. Right. In the meantime, police arrested a young man who confessed to killing the Otero family with two of his friends. So this is now October 1974. At that time, confessions were king. And a main focus of detectives was they wanted that confession. That's what they would really focus in on if especially if they felt they were for sure guilty. Today, we know that people do not confess or that people do confess to things they don't do, even though it's weird. They do. That was the case here. This guy confessed to the killings. Police released to the press that an arrest had been made with a confession. Raider was having none of it. No, he's got an ego. He's not just this. That's where his narcissism came out. So you know what? Two, why would the police just tunnel in on that? I mean, because you can, I would think, be able to prove a confession. You have to know how the bodies look, all the bodies. I have seen confession after confession after confession. Like, if you look at the Memphis Three, they had no idea what was going on. They, you know, they would say, well, I don't know. I Maybe I strangled them. No. Maybe I stabbed them. Railroaded. No. I mean, yeah. you see it a lot. I, I watched a show on false confessions, and they were talking about the psychology of it. But they said one of the things that people don't understand is you begin to think you did it. That's that's how powerful it is. And, you know, you're hungry, you're tired. And after a while, you're like, well, maybe I did it and I didn't realize. And then they'll mm-hmm. start, you know, it's like process of elimination. If you go through mm-hmm. shooting, stabbing, strangling, what's left, you know? So they, they'll just keep trying to hit it until they get the right answer. And that's what the police will go with. And like I said, I think to you is that, you know, we've all known that person that bothers you so much, you just say, okay. Yep. You say whatever they want to say. Just to get them to leave you alone. Just to be quiet and leave you alone. He wrote with horrible spelling in his letter, providing details only the killer would know about the Otero murders. He put the letter in an engineering book in the Wichita Public Library, and then he called the editor of the Wichita Eagle, notifying him of the letter in the book. His extreme narcissism saved the young man and his friends because the young man also recruited his friends in on the confession, which is another thing I don't understand. If you're going to, you know, ruin your life, why bring your friends into it? Well, I guess because they're your friends. (sighs) I've noticed that with false confessions. It's very frustrating. It is. They always add somebody. In between his last killing and the next killing, he and his wife, Paula, had their first child. You know, good for him while he's killing other people's children. A son named Brian. And I'm sure being a new father took a lot of his time and attention. Mm -hmm. I also believe during this time, he crafted his skill through fantasizing, planning, and examining, breaking down, going over and over and over his first murders to get better, but also to relive the moment, because they do that as well. And some of that's true because of things they found. Yes. That he did practice. and. Yep. He also liked wearing his look. victim's yep. clothing, yep. Yep. tying himself up, putting masks and bags over his own head, taking bondage pictures of himself in his leisure time. But and That's he, when they get a lot of questions. Did the wife not know? 
She you know, didn't. Yeah. She didn't know. 100% she didn't know. But, you know, they're asked that. How could you not know? This is one of the bondage pictures. And if I'm not mistaken, like he liked mass. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, he was actually on one of the uh, Boy Scout trips. And he escaped. But I'm not sure. This is another one of them. It's just creepy. He looks like a monster. Yeah. Uh, these are on the website, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. They're just really, really weird. Like, he's Look wrapped up in one. a plastic bag. That's just... And that one. Actually, that one, I think, is the Boy Scout one. But yeah, he would put on their garments, put bags over his own head, or wear masks or whatever. I mean, look, he's hanging. That's just crazy. It is crazy. And then in this one, he's in that bag and puts himself in the grave. In that shallow grave. Yeah. I. You notice in every one, he's got a blanket on mm-hmm. the ground. Yeah. I guess for DNA. Well, of course, they didn't have it then, but that 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 looks like a mask. It is. He really liked masks. Like this one right here is one of them. I, I, it's just disturbing. You know what I mean? Like you've got killers and then you've got disturbing. This is disturbing. That's very disturbing. So I guess it looks like he put the mask on and then he put like a, you know, a, a right. gag around the mask part there. But, yeah, he's just disgusting. It's disgusting. And I don't even want to leave this picture up because it's just gross. So, um, well, I don't even want to see his face. Let's just get the, the letter yeah, up. <laughs> but by this time, though, even though he was sloppy, he had unexpected things happen, he had his M.O. And that was he cut the phone line, attack during the day, and then murder as BTK, which is bind, torture, and then kill. And he even started naming his targets and his plan using military terms. Well, they had which named, we'll get into in the next they episode. They had named him something else. Stupid. The uh, Poop bird. reporters. Dumb. He picked that name. Sicko. Pervert. In a letter he wrote, he picked the name. He chose. Oh his yeah, own he name. branded himself. Which yeah. I'm a brander. You know, that's what one of the things I do for a mm-hmm. living. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so glad you thought of that, you weirdo. How narcissist is that? Yeah. You pick your own name. And he studied the other serial killers that were operating. Yeah. yeah. I really think he thinks he was the best. Probably. The best. Probably. Yeah. I mean, when, well, they can watch, but, you know, when he was confessing, it just, his demeanor's like, oh, yeah, I went and had a cup of coffee. I'm going to the grocery store mm-hmm. in a minute. And, and one, he's like, terrible. um. Yeah. And he does this weird mouth thing like he's trying to, trying remember, to remember the latest Jeopardy show winner. The detective said that he was amazed at his memory, that it was exact. I exact. wonder if he had a photographic memory. I wonder myself. Because his poor spelling, and but he was still able to go through school and stuff. If he had a learning disability, he had to remember technical things. You know, anything mm-hmm. that's technical isn't easy. I mean, there's diagrams and all that stuff to to remember so i wonder if he maybe had that he may have they haven't said but it's just amazing i can't even remember what was for dinner yesterday you i can't i know mean? well, you can tacos oh that's a whole nother story <laughs> all right so we'll uh finish up part one and then we're going to dive into part two okay and i'll finish off the season here in Sedgwick County. nancy fox was another one of the projects uh when I was uh, trolling the area, I noticed her go in the house one night. Sometimes, I'm in, uh, anyway, I put her down as a potential victim. Um, uh, let me ask you one thing, Mr. Rader. You used that term when you were patrolling the area. What do you mean by that? It's called stalking or trolling. So you were not uh, working in any form or fashion? You well, just... I don't know. If, if, well, if you read much about serial killers, they go through what they call the different phases. Uh, that's one of the phases they go through as a, a, as a trolling stage. You're la- basically, you're looking for a victim at that time. And that, you could be trolling for months or years. But once you lock in on a certain person, then you become a stalking. And that might be several of them, but you really hone in on that person. Uh, they, they basically become the, that's, that's the victim, or at least that's what you want to do. Trolling with a T, not a troll. He did say trolling. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. No, sir. no, I wasn't working, sir. Oh. All right. No, this was, no, this was off, off, off my hours. All right. So, 
you basically uh, identified Nancy Fox as one of your uh, projects. What happened then? Uh, at first, uh, she was uh, spotted, and then I did a little homework. I dropped by once to check the mailbox to see what her name was, uh, found out where she worked, uh, stopped by there once at Hillsburg, kind of sized her up. I, the more I knew about a person, the, the more I felt comfortable with it. So I did that a couple of times. And then I just selected a night, which was this particular night, to try it, and it worked out. All right. Can you tell me what you did on the night of December 8th, 1977? Now about two or three blocks away, I parked my car and walked to that residence. I uh, knocked, uh, knocked at the door first to make sure to see if anybody was in there because I knew she arrived home at a particular time from where she worked. Uh, nobody answered the door, so I went around to the back of the house, uh, cut the phone lines. I could tell that there wasn't anybody in the uh, north apartment. Uh, broke in and waited for her to come home in the kitchen. All right, did she come home? Yes, she did. What happened? Uh, I confronted her, uh, told her there I was a, uh, had a problem, sexual problems, that I would have to tie her up and have sex with her. Uh, she was uh, a little upset. Uh, we talked for a while. Uh, she smoked a cigarette. Uh, while, while we smoked a cigarette, I went through her purse, uh, identifying some stuff. She finally said, uh, well, let's get this over with so I can go call the police. I said, okay. And she said, can I go to the bathroom? And I said, yes. Uh, she went to the bathroom and, came, and I told her when she came out to make sure that she was undressed. And uh, when she came out, I uh, handcuffed her. And uh, I don't really remember whether... Sir? You handcuffed her? You had a pair of handcuffs? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What happened then? Well, anyway, I, had her, I handcuffed her, had her lay on the bed. And then I tied her feet, and then uh, I, I, I was also undressed to a certain degree. And then I got on top of her, and then I reached over, took either either feet were tied or not tied. But anyway, I took I think I had a belt. I took the belt and then strangled her with a belt at that time. All right. All right. After you had strangled her, what happened then? Okay. Uh, after I strangled her with the belt, I took the belt off and retied that with pantyhose, real tight. Uh, removed the handcuffs and uh, tied those with uh, with pantyhose. Can't remember the colors right now. Uh, I think I maybe retied her feet. What they had not, they were probably already tied. Her feet were, uh, and at that time, uh, uh, masturbated, sir. All right. Had you had sexual relations with her? No, before? no, no. I told her I was, but I did not. Hmm. So you masturbated. Then what did you do? Uh, Dressed and then went through the house, uh, took some of her personal items, and kind of cleaned the house up, went through it, make checked everything, and then uh, left. Outline of a Murder is a Mr. Joseph production. What do you think, Joseph? Ah!